All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is the DIY... Home DIY oh, Home Creators. Thank you. I had this written down on my notes and then forgot them in my office this afternoon. <laughs> Hasn't been busy at all. Um, so this is an event that is hosted by the Rochester Area Housing Committee, um, which is supported by the White River Valley Consortium, which is supported by the White River Valley Working Communities Challenge Group Grant. Um, <clears throat> the focus is really about how do we support our communities to create additional housing that is going to fit the needs that we're seeing. I work with Capstone Community Action. My name is Linda Anderson. I'm the Director for Family and Community Support Services there. And one of our major programs is housing counseling for folks that are homeless or about to be. Um, a lot of folks think that Vermont doesn't have an issue with homelessness, but they would be wrong. In 2022, we had something like 18.5% of our population was homeless. Um, we have the, per capita, we have the, um, one of the lowest rental vacancies um, in the market, in the country. So there really aren't many places to rent. Those that do exist are way above and beyond what people can pay. So we're really struggling, um, and our employers are struggling, our businesses are struggling, and that's having impact on a lot of things, a lot of systems that we all rely on, like our health care. Um, we heard from Gifford at the listening tour just a few weeks ago, uh, people were talking about, we want to see these services. Unfortunately, housing is impacting our ability to bring those services in. A year and a half ago, Dr. White was talking about the fact that there were over 300 um, like nursing care level beds in the state that weren't open because there wasn't the staffing. Um, so across the board and across our community, housing has been having a huge impact. <clears throat> there is a um, National Low Income Housing Coalition. Uh, if anybody is interested in going to the website, I do have some information here that you're welcome to take and look at. But just to give you an idea of the impact that we're seeing, um, the cost of housing the state housing wage right now is $25.54 per hour. How many of our folks are making $25.54 an hour? I don't know too many people in our community that are making that. Um, we, it's been estimated we need about 30,000 more units in the next 10 years or so to meet the need for housing in the state. The state housing so, yeah, so that is um, fair market rent is just decided by HUD, the Housing and, Ur Housing and Urban Development. They state that the fair market rent for a two bedroom unit is $1,328 a month, and that's sort of the state average. Okay, so it's 1200 and that's what you have to make to right. cover that. Uh, so, okay. with housing and utilities, okay. rent and utilities. Yep. For it to be 30% of your income, which is what sort of the rule of thumb is a healthy housing market, or in a health, sorry, healthy housing budget, you would pay no more than 30% of your rent for your housing expenses. Okay. In order to achieve that, you'd have to make $25.54 an hour to accomplish that, for housing to be 30% of your budget for a two bedroom apartment. Um, and there's some more information here about that. It also breaks down by Addison and Windsor County. So for example, Addison, it's 2292. And in Windsor, it's 2171. So it's boosted by Chittenden County, which is over $30 an hour. So uh, it's definitely a struggle to make it, especially with a minimum wage at 13. Sorry, somewhere here it says, I think we're at 13, 18 an hour for minimum wage. They estimate that you would have to work 78 hours a week at minimum wage to be able to afford that two bedroom apartment. So, big puzzle, how do we solve hom homelessness? We need to create housing. Um, so that's what we're hoping to talk about today. Is what are the ways that we as a community can get creative in addressing this issue? Because it is impacting all of us throughout our communities. So how do we encourage folks and support folks to create additional housing units that are affordable, that um, meet that need, and that can bring some income in to support the home creators? So that's my introduction. Sarah? 
so thanks all. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for the intro, Linda. Um, my name is Sarah Danley. I work for the White River Valley Consortium, and one of the things I do as part of that is help support the Rochester Area Housing Group, which was really just interested in holding this event um, about how community members can become involved in creating housing. So we're going to go into a panel discussion, and then we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. Um, I, <laughs> I, I really don't. <laughs> So I will, um, I'll prompt you all with the prompts that I had previously sent you, but why don't we just do a brief intro of the three, each of you give a brief intro first so folks know who you are, and then I'll start with Kevin after that. Q, do you want to do a brief intro? I'm Gio Honeyford, I live in South Royalton, and um, I'm not really sure why I'm here, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I now buy uh, uninhabited houses and I rehabilitate them and I put them back on the market. I'm Kevin Geiger. I'm the director of planning for your regional planning commission, which is the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission, and we work on several housing initiatives. I'm Dee Gish. I live in the town of Sharon, and we had a little housing project that I'll talk to you about later. So. Great. So Kevin, I'm hoping you can start. Um, I, I actually want to come back to you at the end with like other considerations, okay. but I'm hoping you can actually start just by talking about ADUs because ADUs are um, all, there's a lot of attention mm -hmm. and interest in ADU. So like, what is an ADU? What's the basic premise? Why is Two Rivers excited about it? Yeah. Um, so ADUs is is kind of a zoning term. Um, used to be called things like mother-in-law apartments, whatever, but accessory dwelling units are a thing now in statute. Uh, and you may hear a lot of talk about ADUs in California or other places, but Vermont, pretty much Vermont has made the door very wide open for ADUs. It, every town now has to allow ADU, no matter what your zoning says, and every person who has a single family house can put an ADU on the same lot, no matter what your zoning says. That is state law. Just, it just overrode any local prohibitions against this type of things. Depending upon how much you've been paying attention to that, that ADU provision has morphed over the last few years. It used to be 30% um, of the size of your house. It used to be that the owner had to live in the house and then you could rent the ADU. Now it's, the owner just has to live somewhere on the lot. So you can, the owner can live in the ADU, the owner can live in the house. Um, but it has to be an owner-occupied lot. The ADU is now 30% of the house of the of the house house, or 900 square feet, whichever is greater. And so, if you have a 900 square foot house, you get a 900 square foot ADU. You don't have to have a 300 square foot ADU. Um, if you have a 10,000 square foot house, I suppose you get a 3,000 square foot ADU. Um, if you have a 21,000 square foot house, which exists. Uh, you, then you can get a great big ADU. And the ADU is not, it used to be a, a one bedroom basic studio, and now it's not limited. It, it can be a full-fledged house out there. Uh, so the zoning pain has gone away. Uh, and However, it still requires a permit, if you have zoning. Um, Sharon doesn't have zoning, Royalton doesn't have zoning. So you can just go build an ADU there, you don't get anything from the town. Uh, my town, proper, we have zoning. A lot of towns do. Rochester. Still need a state separate. But you still need a state separate, <laughs> right? And so I'm going to hit on those things a little bit. Yes. Hi, Cricket. Uh, so uh, the 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 some of the big things that come into play though are you still need a permit. Every permit is appealable, and we have had people, you know, oh, the neighbor wants to build a little ADU, and I'm kind of like used to looking out of that bit of yard that is in my yard, um, but I like looking at there. Oh, they get a, now I can appeal that permit. Or I can just threaten to appeal that permit. And I can tie that up in court for two or three years with very little effort and drive you crazy. Um, so one of the things we're suggesting to towns when they deal with these, and we've gotten at least one town, and I think now two to adopt it, is those don't even need permits. Those are like garden sheds. Just do it. As long as that's within the setback and you've got your state septic permit and that type of thing, off you go. There is no permit, therefore there's no appeal, therefore they can't slow you down, which is kind of nice. Um, we do remind people and 
getting a local permit is one of those ways to remind people that there are other permits out there that if you have a three bedroom house and you've got a three bedroom system, you need another state permit to expand your septic system to add on an ADU. Or if you have a three bedroom house and an unknown septic system, which is much more the case, you better go get a state permit. If you're going to rent either of those, you're gonna need a state building permit, which people don't often understand because you come into a town like Sharon Royalton and you may go, do I need a permit? And they go, nope, and off you go. Um, and, and they don't go, oh yeah, but you need this permit and you need this permit and you need this permit. So we try to educate people in the world of permits out there. Um, and that's one of the things we're actually trying to build. Uh, there are various, uh, AARP has a thing over there, the state has some stuff, other people have stuff. But we're trying to build a little knowledge compendium around all the things that one might run into just so that it's at least easily available for people who get into this and want to do the various steps, who to call and, and get through that. So that's about ADU. Yeah, great. So we'll come back to you then with considerations for other types, yep. but thank you for doing the intro on ADUs. Um, and Dee, we wanted to go to you next to share a little bit about your project. Okay. So sort of. Um, so you want to pull up those yeah, slides? Yeah, so Do you want me to sit over there? Or do you want uh, me to? Up? Totally up to you. <laughs> so really sharing what you did, what motivated you to do it, how the process yeah. went. Um, okay. Just generally your story of what you've been working on. Sure. Well, like, like I mentioned before, I live in the town of Sharon, and... I was happily working at Two Rivers out of Queechee. <laughs> and then this property came up right in the village there. Um, it'll come back up. And it was for sale. And the town of Sharon, we felt, I just felt like really needed uh, a gathering place. So my husband and I had this great idea to open a cafe, right? So this was November of 2019. We signed the contract for that house. And then what happened? COVID. So we're like, okay, a cafe is not a great idea. And actually, when we started looking into building requirements, because we were going to have the cafe on the bottom and maybe rent an apartment upstairs, but fire codes, and it was getting a little crazy. So we scrapped that idea and decided to create housing units instead, which are also desperately needed, like in so many places. And it's right in the village, so you can walk to the post office, the town hall, the schools, it's a great location. Um, so we got started on building housing units. And really, COVID was a blessing in disguise for that project because we had secured a contractor. And my husband is retired, so he works side by side with our building contractor. You can start just going through the slides. Um, so, But it, it, that house was built in 1851, I think. So we really wanted to save a lot of the historic attributes of that of that project of that house but our contractors like no nothing square uh, you probably have some rot i wouldn't recommend we wanted to save all the flooring and the base the beadboard and he's like no so we listened to him and we gutted the place so i worked on it my husband worked pretty much full time with the contractor we tore down lath and plaster we tore up all the floors. There was a, t a time when a, we were working in the attic, I think. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So we could see from the attic down through to the basement. It was terrifying. But I was up there ripping out everything. Oh, Anyway, so it was, and it was COVID. So we had nothing else to do. You couldn't go anywhere. And um, so it, again, it was a blessing in disguise. And we got a really good interest, mortgage interest rate, which you can't get anymore. And our contractor had secured um, supplies, lumber, and all the building materials before the prices spiked. So it was, again, COVID was a blessing in disguise. We roped our son into helping. He's not happy in that picture, ripping out walls and lath and plaster. And here he is in the basement doing some ceiling work. It was quite something. So I can tell you stories about that. We also found when we were digging up the floors, we took out a couple staircases that were not code, not up to code, and we found this velvet box, blue velvet box, historic. I'm like, this is it. We're going to pay for it. I can't wait to see the family jewels or whatever. We open it up. It's a lock of hair <laughs> and some, like, buttons and stuff. Anyways, the, the neighbor, it was an old historic family plot, a farm, 
and the neighbor still lived there, so we're like, I'm going to give this to you. <laughs> She's like, I don't think I want this one. I'm like, no, it really should stay with you. <laughs> That's the story. But anyway, um, so we did a lot of the work ourselves, and climate change is really uh, an important consideration for us, so we wanted to make it as energy efficient as possible. We had applied for a village center designation uh, tax grant, or whatever mm -hmm. they call it, um, but they wanted us to keep a lot of the historic attributes, including the leaded windows, which we couldn't even open because they were like painted shut a couple times and um, very energy inefficient. So we're like, we're not going to take the grant because we want to make these improvements. So we replaced 29 windows um, and did a lot of rock wool. Um, this is a, a part of the thing we wanted to create three units, and one of the units didn't have enough upstairs space to really make it livable, so we put in a dormer that was probably like the most expensive part of our project was putting in a new dormer and roofing and all that stuff. So, um, And also, also, this is, we put in, we replaced the old fuel, uh, pro, uh, I think it was an oil burner with a uh, pellet stove, which is amazingly efficient. My husband cleans it out maybe twice a year, and there's a little pile of ashes at the bottom of that thing. Uh, so that was helpful, too, and it really looks... And then we put in heat pump hot water heaters, which, are, again, are amazingly efficient. We did have to, have to put in another, an additional <laughs> septic for the third unit, um, and that's the water storage tank for all the units. And we just recently, because last year, you may remember during the winter time, we had a lot of power outages. And this, the, the village of Sharon historically would never really suffer power outages, but we did several times, a couple lasting several days. And we have one tenant that's uh, in their 80s. And they actually came and stayed with us because we didn't want them to freeze. Um, so this year, we just last week installed some Tesla power walls so that we can keep the heat and the water on during a power outage. They might have to light a candle to see, but they will not freeze. So this is our, like, I call it the submarine. All the systems there um, look like that. But anyway, so again, we, we got really lucky with the timing, I think. We also tried to keep a lot of the the charm of the historic place. We kept the radiators. We had them repainted, but we were able to use the old radiators with the, the pellet boiler system. Uh, what else? Uh, and painting was fun, too. We got to do some <laughs> fun painting, and we had to put in three, two new kitchens, three new bathrooms. Um, and again, the prices we were able to secure some good pricing before all the inflation went. And this is uh, the unit that our 80-year-old couple went. It was important to us to make it uh, elderly friendly. It's not quite ADA accessible. We wish we would have given a little bit more space for the toilet. It's kind of hard to get in and out of, but we do have grab bars and made it one floor living. So that was a, a big concern of ours because eventually I think when my husband and I get sick of living on top of a hill with an ice luge in the winter, <laughs> our driveway, we'll move into that place. Um, so it was really, again, important for us. And you know, this is just one of my values. I'd rather, I wanted to invest in my community, so I took money out of our retirement savings instead of keeping it with multinational corporations that don't give a rip about us. I wanted to invest in my community. So um, we invested in real estate. And anyway, it was just something that was important to us again. So there's a, a barn in the back, a huge barn. So you can kind of see the corner of it over there. So that might be our next adventure. If we can find some more area for septic and water would be to convert the barn into some additional units. Um, now that we have some experience, we don't have to rip out lath and plaster in the barn, thankfully, but <laughs> we could start fresh. But um, that was our experience. So again, we, we applied for some grants, um, the Downtown Village Center Tax Credit. Um, that was helpful, but again, we didn't get the grant. We did apply because you can get it for 
a couple of different things like aesthetics on the outside which I mentioned the windows they wanted to keep the leaded windows so we didn't go for that but you can also get it to make your project up to code which is what we applied for because we had to get fire certification like Kevin mentioned um, an electric certification we needed to uh, up our electric stuff in the building um, so we did apply for that but I think generally those downtown village tax center grants are for a little bit larger project although they did like we they give you a ranking after you apply so you can see where you scored on the ranking and we were kind of up there because they I think they look at need of your particular town and I'm sure Rochester Granville Hancock has a high need for housing in those grants and we also had a considered they had a program I'm not sure if they still do where they will assist people um, with housing projects if you keep the rent below a minimum like a yeah, yeah help me out below but, I think it's maybe 80 percent of fair market something like that but when we did the math since we had to do such extensive renovations and our property taxes are kind of high in the town of Sharon we couldn't make that work so we're not charging exorbitant rents or anything like that but um, we couldn't keep it below that fair that 80 percent of fair market value so that did not work for us but those grants are out there I just wish there were more grant opportunities for kind of do-it-yourself people that really their hearts in the right place they want to help their communities but it is super expensive so <laughs> I'm not gonna sugarcoat that but it it's an investment that my husband and I felt that was right for our community and that's really why we did it so. how long did the process take like when did you when did you finish and have tenants move in uh, so we closed in May of 2020, and we had tenants uh, by the end of the year, 2020. Wow. Yeah. That's but fast. again, we had that. It was COVID, right. so there was nothing else to do. <laughs> so we were in there doing the work. Yeah. So that, the 80-year-old couple was our first tenants. And then uh, the, the, the third unit was with the big dormer. They moved in in July. Yeah. Of the following. Yes. Yep. What are we doing questions, Sarah? Um, we, I was thinking we could do questions at the end. Okay. If that works for folks. I mean, like one here or there for clarification is okay. fine, but maybe let's just do them mostly at the end. Great. Anything else, Steve? That was great. I think that's all I have. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Next, wanted to go to Geo, and one of the reasons I was interested in having Geo on the panel is specifically because you don't rent out and you don't have tenants. Um, I think a lot of the conversation is focused on like the apartments that are rented out, and there's a huge demand for ownership of houses as well, and not everyone wants to be or should be a landlord too. So I was really interested in hearing you speak about your work specifically because it is about selling homes, not about being a landlord of apartments. All right. So, 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 so I know quite a bit of people in here, and that I'm <laughs> no longer farming because I was doing this. What I'm going to describe for you uh, part time in the in the winters when I was in my non farm season, and then um, I decided I need a change in my life, and I like doing it, so I just went full time at it. So what I do is I look around for. I've, I've learned now because uh, I got burned on one place. I, I need a house that you can't live in. If I buy a house that someone can live in and rehab it while they're there, it's too much money. It's, and then I can't, I can't make my kind of money on it. But if no one can live there, it's perfect for me. Um, so the last one I just did, uh, I just finished, I, it's under contract. We closed on the 31st. Um, every single window in the house was broken. It was a 1790 Cape. Bones were good, foundation was good, roof was uh, not leaking. I don't know why it wasn't leaking, but it was um, it, it just it didn't know how to leak, I guess, it, but it was unbelievable. Um, and uh, this, people had left all their furnishings in the house. It, our dump bill was $3,500 just hauling their stuff out. Um, and so when I showed this to my mother, my mother goes, just burn it down. 
why would you even work with this? Um, it's like, no, this is a great house. It's going to be a great house when it's done. And uh, so that's what I do. I, it took me a year and a half, just me. Um, I think the only thing I hired out was the standing seam roof. Um, but I, I'm not a flipper, I, 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 uh, because flippers are um, opportunists. They come in, they'll do one or two things, and then turn over the property. I do everything. If I see it's a problem, I fix it. Um, even though I know that no one's ever going to go up in the attic and check the insulation, I'm going to put. I'm going to do it right because I'm like like I was going to live there. So um, so what I turned over, what I'm going to turn over here in a, a week or so is this 1790 Cape that has all the low ceilings and some exposed beams and old floors. It's got all the, those kind of charms, but it's completely as tight as you can get a 1790 Cape in terms of insulation. I also have a heat pump water heater because I believe in that kind of stuff. I have a heat pump for a heating system in the house. Um, and if you don't know about those, you need to do some research. They work and they're energy efficient. Um, and don't let anybody tell you they don't work. Just do enough research because anybody in the fossil fuel business will tell you heat pumps don't heat your house, but they do. Um, so uh, it's... The one, uh, we did one in, that we acquired in Bethel um, that we had to actually, the back side of the house was all rotted out. We had to jack it up, put a new supporting piece in. So sometimes it's a, it, we can get into foundational stuff like that. Um, I had to put a new septic in the, this one here I just did. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it, it can be a variety of work, but um, if you get the place for the right price, the one we just finished in Bethel not too long ago. At one time I had four houses. One I was living in, three I was working on. So I just finished the last one of those three and I can't find another one. So right now I'm just subbing out as a, as, as, as a contractor. But we, when I, we told it up, I had a partner on that one, we made $95 an hour for every hour we worked there. Um, and uh, this next one, the one I just did, I won't make that kind of money, but I'm going to make really good money. Um, the, the secret is to what I do is I don't get paid for a year and a half. <laughs> so I have to have enough money. So I had to put 90000 into the house. I have to have money to live on and money to put in the house and not make a dime. So when it comes down to, like, can I rent the place? I'm sure I can. But now I don't get any money. <laughs> I need that money for the next place. So I, I, need to, I need to sell it. I have to sell it because the business model it works on that kind of framework. Um, I'm also not interested in, in, in renting too much because I sort of poured my heart and soul into this place and it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. the floors are sanded yeah. and the drywall's <laughs> done and everything's, you know, and I, I don't worry about the imperfections of it's a 1790 house. If the, you know, the door frame isn't quite plumb and level, that's okay. People expect that in the 1790 house. Um, I'm not gonna rent it and then five years later have a place that's, even if they don't abuse it, it's still lived in. It's still, I, I got this beautiful thing I can sell. So it's just, I just wanna turn it over to the next person mm -hmm. and like, that was, that was great. Um, so it's, it's, it's the, the one place I did buy, I bought a place in Stockbridge that, um, in reality, I didn't do well on it. I, it was a break, I broke even. Um, so that's, I consider that not doing well if I'm just breaking even. Um, but it was, it was livable. And, and I probably paid too much money for it. And then by the time I did all my fixes, had, had I had the flipper mentality on that, I probably would have done okay. Just did a few things that I had quickly identified and then I turned it over. The other thing I've kind of learned to do is I don't, I don't worry about kitchens or bathrooms. I, because they're, you can spend $25,000 on a kitchen and two years later they're gonna tear it out and put in their dream kitchen. So I give them a functional kitchen. I go to the recover store and I buy cabinets. Or in my case, when I left the farm, I bought a house, I redid the kitchen, I took those, that kitchen and put it in the next house. Um, so you get a functional kitchen, it all works. Everything's there, but um, I didn't spend a whole lot of money putting it in. And so when they tear it out, it's not going to break my heart. Um, 
and and I've, it doesn't really help. I'm convinced on the sale of the house because no one, no one's buying their dream kitchen. Their dream kitchen's in their head. It's, it's the house doesn't have it. It's the same with bathrooms. Um, uh, and then I, I I often sub out for people. I got some some guys I know in Woodstock that do high end work, and uh, they'll hire me to tear out a kitchen, and then I'll take that kitchen and put it in one of my houses. So this house in Bethel. Good thing you have a truck. <laughs> <laughs> this this house in Bethel that we sold for it was a we, it was a small house. We sold it for like 190 thousand. It has 12 thousand dollars worth of granite in it mm. because I just tore it out of another house in Woodstock and put it over here. And it didn't cost me any. I got paid to take out the kitchen, and I got the kitchen, and I put it in the next house. Um, so um, that's that's what I've been doing. Um, and it's you see these places. That's the other thing is you see these places. They're everywhere, and you see you're probably thinking of two or three places right now. Oh, that house that sits on the corner of there. It's just falling apart. No one's been in there for years. So. It's actually tough to acquire these places. I don't know why families don't sell them, but they don't sell them. I don't know if they harbor the illusion that they're somehow going to get in there and fix it up. Um, I've seen places that I've cold uh, contacted people and said, you know, I'll buy that house, I'll fix it up and resell it and put it back on the market and there'll be a new family in there. And they're, no, that's, that's grandpa's old place, we're not going to sell that. And <laughs> Ten years later, at the front half of the house is now collapsed off, and, and it's useless. I, I don't know why that happens. Um, so it's actually not as easy to identify these places when they come on the market as you would think. Um, and they don't come on, sometimes they come, like I said, they come on in spurts. I had four, three I was working on at one time, and now I don't have any. Um, but there's not much happening in terms of the market. I got a right barn now. to you. <laughs> <laughs> you get a perk test on that. I'll, I'll, I'll. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm up to. Okay. Thanks, Jill. Kevin, just we can go back to you briefly before we close out the panel. Um, yeah. Um, the, the place we're working, we're trying to work on in terms of capacity, is um, imagine D's tenant. Living the 80-year-old couple lives in the old house. That's that's what you have. Uh, so we have a lot of houses we're convinced that have seniors living in them that aren't in senior-friendly spaces, and they don't want to be a landlord. They don't own a mortgage. They haven't paid on a mortgage for decades, so they want to sell. They don't want an ADU because ADUs are typically rented. But now every house in Vermont you can duplex. That's just state law. So they could duplex that house, get a short-term construction loan, duplex that house, have somebody like Geo do the work, have a better unit. Now we have a second housing unit because they're not using a bunch of that house to begin with. And we think that that is the slice that we want to concentrate on because there's a lot of built capacity out there. It doesn't take nearly as much to do it from the ground up if we have a house out there and the person probably has equity to fund the, the project, but they don't, they want to get in, they want to sell the other half and get back out. And then they don't have another mortgage again. You know, they're at the, as my mother says, uh, she doesn't buy green bananas. You know, they're at the green bananas phase of life. And like, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't have a mortgage here. We're moving on. Um, but th they want to live in there. And we think that people, that they should be living in there, that there is big value in keeping those people in your communities. They, they have wisdom, they perform roles in your town, they do all sorts of things, and what the number is, who knows. But if they have to move out of town, you lose some value. And so if we can keep them there, and their health is really you know, tied to that place. They know the doctor, they may be able to drive from there to the general store and back, but they probably really shouldn't drive anywhere else. Um, a whole bunch of things make them healthy by living in that particular spot. And, um, and so that's where we're trying to build capacity for those home creators who, who are probably the owners. But I, part of the issue we think is a big psychological hurdle of going, oh, I actually don't need all this house. And oh, I actually you know, am not able to paint and fix this thing up anymore. But how can somebody bring some capacity to those folks and do that? Because there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those houses out there. 
And the other issue becomes who's going to do the work because um, right now this guy in Woodstock, he pays me $50 an hour to work for him. So when I look at this chart here and you're saying not many people make that kind of money, it's like, you can. <laughs> this, that's the kind of work you got to do. And now the no one's industry going, where we see a lot of our folks. No one's going into the 2554. Yeah, no, no one goes into the trades. Everybody I see is my age. And we're all aging out. Yeah. I got offered a construction job the other day. I was walking by. Big <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> need for it right now, especially after all the flooding. So I, I think we just go into any questions from you all. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Gio. Uh, have you accessed any of these grants or low interest um, loans through some of these programs through the state? Yeah, because I'm selling. That I haven't seen anything that applies to me. Maybe these guys know of something. Uh, that I do go to Efficiency Vermont and like I get money off the hot, mm -hmm. the the, mm -hmm. the heat pump things. I get money, some money. It's not much money for the insulation. Um, all told, it might have been. Three or four thousand dollars, you know, and if if I rent it, then I'd be eligible for these mm -hmm. kind of things. Right, and in that situation, I kind of walked in maybe at the beginning with this renting. Is there there's a certain price that you have to rent for mm -hmm. to? There's certain clientele, excuse me, clientele you have to rent to. Is that correct? So there are different programs. The a lot of the incentives right now are trying to um, create opportunities that allow folks that are homeless at the moment. Um, create space for them. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at homeless preferences, they're looking at maintaining rents within, I think it was 80% of fair market rent. Um, don't quote me on that. Mm -hmm. um, but we, I think the, uh, the information was in the brochure that we had. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, there have been an increasing number of subsidies that have been put out there, short term and long term. And what we're seeing is that People can't add, use them. Um, Section 8, that was sort of the gold standard. The landlord gets a guaranteed amount of money every month. Hopefully their tenants can come up with a balance of it. Um, but we're seeing only about 25% of those um, vouchers that are being given out, Section 8 and the shorter term 18-month um, vouchers that help people get to a place of stability and get on their feet. Only about 25% are being used. 75% mm. are going back. So we're seeing a lot of people that are really disheartened and think it's basically a joke. What is the point of going through all of these efforts to try to get this when I can't find a unit that's going to qualify? Mm -hmm. So that's been a big struggle as well. Indeed. Did you say you had used some Village Center credits that didn't impose income limit restrictions? or we, we were not awarded that grant, okay. but we did apply for it. So I have a um, question about the designated village. Um, I know that I just read Waitsfield had um, revamped a lot of things, including their designated village, because villages change over time. And I'm feeling like, particularly in Rochester, the village, designated village is small compared with what the reality of people that consider that they live in the village, meaning that they could walk to different to the services, um, they're, they're not going to be able to take advantage of any tax credits because the village is small. So is, are the, is that ever changed or re-looked at, or how does that happen? Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting looked at right now. It's, it gets very arcane very fast, even for people like me who try to pay attention to it. Um, because there's designated villages, there's designated downtowns, there's growth centers, there's neighborhood development areas, all have different um, things. The, but suffice it to say that that problem is a problem everywhere and that those boundaries are very small. And so e the legislature will do one of two things, I think, this year. It'll either stop making all these things and say, there's, there's just one, we're only going to have one name for all this stuff. Um, they may say we want to make these things bigger. Right now, those fringe areas would be a neighborhood development area, and you'd go for that designation, um, which is actually in some ways even better for permitting-wise and whatnot. Does that qualify for the tax credit, though? Yep. Oh. Yep. Okay. I know that maybe that's what Waitsfield did. They had three or four different areas. Um, but I know that, you know, if an incentive's going to work, it has to be able to reach 
those houses that you were speaking about that maybe are occupied by one person or that you still can walk to town, but it's not right along Route 100. Right. And it's, it's a process. Towns have to apply, and you have to have it in your plan, and you have to have a map, and you have to do some things again. Um, my policy take on all this, which I keep throwing out to anybody who will listen, is, is I think it's, we should use the ice cream truck model, which is ding, ding, and ding, all of the ice cream truck comes along and they go, ice cream, and you go out and get the ice cream. Why do all this stuff? We could just go every village in Vermont. There's the circle, there's the circle. We got, we got villages all over the region, my region, that aren't designated because somebody hasn't done some paperwork. Why are we waiting? Why, that looks like a village to me. There you go, there you go. Oh, where's the edge of this? You know, make them bigger. Just do this stuff fast and easy. And the, the big issue is those tax credits have a limit in the state that's pretty paltry. They have no limit. Um, get that, get this stuff done. So who would do that? The select board or the? Top no, the leg This is really a legislator stuff. This is really good. The, the, to do a lot of this stuff. And a lot of it actually doesn't cost the state any money to do. I mean, there's things that will cost money, um, but other things don't cost money. So the state designates the village? Yes. Yeah. And the state can change the village? The state could. It, it goes through um, a, a board, and it's a pretty tight boundary. Like, you know, Hartford, for example. You think, well, there's a lot of downtown Hartford. No, the, the Hartford downtown is very small. Um, same thing in Randolph. But our village could get this neighborhood development but as area. another ring as around. An, as another ring around, right. And, and But that's something that the state does or the select board asks for? The, the, uh, the planning commission would actually work on it. Uh, and then, yeah, the select board would, would do some stuff. We usually help mm -hmm. um, towns. And then you go to the state and you get a process there. Uh, but let's try to make these things easy, easy. Do you know the boundaries? For Rochester, in terms of village, yeah. uh, pretty much. I mean, it basically is back of the Huntington north House, of, north of town. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not you. Okay. Like right <laughs> across from the um, fire station, basically. Okay. And it comes, and it only goes up to um, the the house after the parsonage, and then it goes across the street to the Huntington House area, mm. and then it goes down to where the Catholic Church is, but it doesn't go up any of the hills at all or up like Kennedy Drive or even down to where like Ethan's studio is. I think it includes the Hill Center. The what? I think it includes the Hill Center. The Hill Center? I think so. They're all, if you just Google the Village Center Vermont, you'll okay. get the map. I'm trying to pull it up right now if I can to project it on the screen. Oh. And it's on the Two Rivers site. Too. Yeah. You get to the other site. Um, but it, it's small, and I think that, you know, if the neighborhood designation is a way to go, certainly that would be helpful. And maybe that's what I read that Waitsville did. Yeah, that's, that's probably what they did. And people refer to those as NDAs, which it always makes me think of non-disclosure agreements. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's what it's called in the trade. ADUs, NDAs, we have acronyms for everything. I got a question for Dee. Um, did you, when you decided to do this project, did you have any master plan, like the, you know, your rate of return when, you know, when you were going to, when you're finished, how much it's going to cost mm -hmm. and how long is it going to take you to recoup that? I know you're, you know, you're in, in favor of community, right. um, and it, that's what it takes a lot. Mm. Uh, I'm I'm part of Rochester here. I've done, I did what Geo did uh, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and you know, working after work to to create housing that I am now reaping a benefit to. Mm -hmm. But I never did any of that. I just worked my ass off, you know, after work and weekends. Mm -hmm. But you know. Doing it yourself makes a huge difference, yeah. huge. Mm -hmm. um, but I wish I had done that kind of concept of like, well, how long is it going to take to finish this? 
I just didn't have it together back then, you know. And I was wondering if you had that I that concept of like, well, I, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna do this work, and in ten years, it'll pay off, or twelve or fifteen or whatever. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, 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 that's how we do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we did get um, a few estimates for construction costs. Um, and it was pretty, I mean, I, I think when you get an estimate, they make it as, as close as yeah. possible. And it, it worked out. Um, but it wasn't, it's not going to be a, a money maker per se, unless we were to sell it. Um, but we, we intend to live there eventually. Right. And um, so you have, continue so you to. Plans and, yes. Right. Yes. And to do the work yourself made sense. Right. If right. we would have gotten like the tax credit award, that would have helped a lot. Um, I think that was about thirty thousand dollars, which would have helped with the code compliance, like the plumbing and the fire yep. safety and everything like that. That would have helped a lot. I also have a question for Geo. Um, do you think the market uh, in the last few years has is is detrimental to your model? Uh, the one we sold to Bethel certainly wasn't because <laughs> the we we sold that at the right time. Right. Uh, I. But now I'm talking. I'm saying there's there's so few properties on the market. There's so few that there's still people out there buying them, right. even though the interest rates are higher. Um, yeah, it didn't. It it took me. I mean, I I went swinging for the fences on the first price I put on the house. I just put up. It's like well, I'm gonna try to see if I can get three forty five for it, and. I, people looked at it, Bingo. but they didn't. They didn't. They didn't bite. Right. So then I just two weeks later, I just lowered the price. Um, I mean, I got my profit margins were good enough that I could just do that. And um, so it took me 50 days to sell it to get it under contract. Yeah. So it's and only because if I'd put a more realistic price on right away, I would have probably had it sold in five or six days. <coughs> so um, yeah. I I pretty much did what you are doing like 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, I worked as a contractor, and when I would renovate, they would be like, well, I want a new bathroom. So I'd pull the bathroom out, store it in a <laughs> barn, and now one of them is up in this apartment, a kitchen, kitchenette. Uh, and I did a, you know, you basically do it on a shoestring because I was way over my head when I bought that building, you know. Like, but you just, that's, that's what you do. And, and there's no real model, it's just hard work. You know, like, um, I, I, I think that, honestly, um, in Rochester, uh, there is, there's a number of young builders. I am part of this housing committee and I've you tried to get one of those young builders, right? <laughs> I am not one of those young builders, <laughs> but I am mentoring them. And I reached out to all of them and, and basically I said, this is an opportunity to do ADU construction. And if, if someone were to say, I'm your guy, because there's a, a number of people that are interested. And I, I really firmly believe that um, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a good model for the next 10 or 15 years, because there is tax credits, there is grants available. Um, you know, wh what I found by is by doing it myself, I never got any of those grants or credits, but because, not number one, I wasn't that smart at that point but to research and to get the, you know, get the information, but basically, um, when you do it yourself, there's a lot of uh, uh, like, oh no, well, we can't help you. Like, even Efficiency Vermont, I mean, I'm still working on these buildings, you know, energy efficiency. I D DIY'd the spray foam. Oh, you gotta hire a contractor. You know, I'm like, okay. So that, that bothers me. That little, that s section of this, com mm -hmm. this complex, how we're gonna get housing, uh, bothers me a great deal that you can't just do it yourself. Yeah. You have to hire a contractor yeah. um, and basically put the money out, then you can get it back. 
but you have to have that money to start. Yeah. You know. I, and it's, you could do this, what I'm doing, at, at the, because I'm buying the right places for the right prices. I would still make money if I subcontracted out everything. I wouldn't make nearly the money I'm making. I'm not even close to the money I'm making. But I, at the end of the day, I would still have a profit um, if I contracted out everything else. Because most contractors aren't making, like I said, that place we sold in Bethel, $95 an hour. I, that's a hell of a profit margin. So um, I could easily pay somebody $30, $40 an hour to do stuff for me. But so are you registered with Efficiency Vermont to be able to be one of their qualified people that you can no. do the work yourself? No, you, no, you hire those pe parts out if you are looking to get the rebates from them? Yeah, but a lot of this, I don't, I'm, I'm not a spray foam kind of guy because it off gases, so I don't use that. Um, so a lot of the stuff that the, like they might pumps, require a contractor you, to do. Yeah. Um, like I had, there was two things on this last house, the standing seam roof, which I'm not equipped to do. And um, I had the guy install the, the heat pump compressors. I did all the duct work, all the insulation, all, I ran all the wiring, I did all that. He just put those in because he could get the, the like Dean was saying, he could get the money from the state, I couldn't. So he could get that discount for doing that. So that was, I could do what he was doing, but then I wouldn't get that, that money. Did you accomplish your first one? Do you, forgive me if this is too personal, you don't have to answer, but you said I have to have 18 months where I don't make anything, and I also have to have the money to buy the property first. So how did you do that first one? It, it makes sense how you do the next one, and the next one, once you've sold one, you have money to buy one, and you have money to live on while you're working on it, but how do you do the first one if somebody's trying to get into what you're doing? So I was, I was doing it by my... I had a farm, mm -hmm. and a vegetable farm, which actually makes money as opposed to a dairy farm, mm -hmm. which doesn't. Mm -hmm. true. Um, Very true. <laughs> so I wasn't, it's not a terribly lucrative profession, but I was making money that way, and so then I was, that was an off-season job mm -hmm. that I was doing. So then I had some money coming in. Yeah. Uh, when I sold my farm, that was, okay. a, and, and, and one of the things that uh, someone mentioned in here is I, I call it like it's a deferred investment. The house I bought now, um, I just spent six months working on it to fix, fix it all up. And, and it wasn't so much because we needed to have that work done right away, but now that that work is done, say it's not a dream house for us because you know when we age out, when I'm 80, there's too many steps in there. It's not gonna be a good house, but I fixed it up. Now we can sell it, so I've, I've, I've made the money it's, I'm not going to see that money for 20 years, but I'm going to see it. So we did the same thing with the farm. The farm was really run down, uh, just a, it was literally falling down, and fixed it all up, made it really nice. And so when I sold it, um, we sold it for considerably more than we bought it for and sold it as a working operation. So that was my nest egg. Gotcha. That's where my, so went and bought a house cash, the rest of it into my business. That was Cost less than what you sold the farm for. Right. Yeah. Cool. I, I mean, I'm hearing that that's another. Neither of you had to go borrow money at seven percent to do your projects. Right. Right. And, that's key. And so, or eight and a half. Yeah. Um, or eight and a half. Yeah. Right. And it, it's a nice place to be in. That's why I can, if a, a rundown house comes available, not too many people can buy those, right. because you you have to have the assets yeah. to, right. to to buy it and, and do it. Kevin, you said you were talking earlier um, about minimums. I think you were saying minimum size, mm -hmm. like the twenty-one thousand square foot home with Nina. So can you can you say that again? Go through that again. I just don't think I caught that correctly. So, so in Vermont, everybody who has a house yeah. um, is allowed by right to go get a zoning permit if you have a zoning, um, and if you don't, it's even easier to build an ADU on that property, which is inside, attached, or detached accessory dwelling unit that's up to 30 percent of the square footage of the up main to. okay and I then it the other way yeah it had to be 30, 30 no and then towns can we have many towns that go 50 percent okay. or 1200 square feet uh, it's but it's 30 percent or 900 square feet now whichever is greater so everybody gets 900 square feet for an adu okay. which is 
just fine. I mean, yeah. About the size like of my house. A minimum? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, it's like a, the smallest space you've seen. There isn't one. Like, think. for an, it would probably be like just a, a little studio. Studio. Um, yeah, I mean. I mean, we're thinking because we live in the, well, we don't live in the village, I guess. We I want to work the in the village. I mean, I walk well, back I and forth, so I technically And I so we have a heated room over our garage, which our kids have stayed in for years. But we don't have any, like, plumbing or connections to town water, town sewer, which is what we would have. So we're trying to think about, like, if we put a small addition on that would be the kitchen, bathroom with the plumbing and stuff. ADUs, I know that you have to have um, places to cook and sanitary facilities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's what we would be looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. And the important thing is if you rent versus you sell, because um, I don't know if you had to get into it, I mean, you, you probably had for plumbing, and, but you didn't say, it, if you have a, the staircase in my house is not code compliant. So I couldn't rent my house with my staircase in it. Yeah, there's, there's um, staircase. Yeah. But, you know, so if you're renting anything, railings, stairs, everything is, everything has to meet code. And in Vermont, we do not require single family houses to meet code. Uh, so that's important for people to understand from the get go, I'm, I'm doing this space, are you gonna rent it or are you gonna sell it? Because different rules are gonna apply. And, oh, I don't wanna sell, I'm gonna rent it now. All of a sudden, oh, I'm doing five different things that I hadn't planned on doing. Yeah, this would be less. Egress windows and you, you name it. What if the intention was neither to rent it or sell it, it was to provide housing for my children in the future? Where it's like actually one of, you know, if you have enough land, put a little, little house there for them. You know, knowing that like in our house, when we age out, I'm going to that section of the house, yeah. you know. And, you know, like the oldest, you know, would take, but there'll be little dwellings there with the intention not to sell them. It's just part of, would, would that the ADU? That that's, might be an ADU, it might be. Would only one of them be like an ADU? Yeah, right now in Vermont, you can only get one as a minimum, but again, towns, I have several towns that say, you get two. Or we don't care how many you get. Two, but the same percentage-wise, it worked out. It's like no, they're smaller properties. Yeah. As um, opposed to one larger one. Yeah. And in, in zoning, you get into whether it would be subdividable. So I, I'll put a house over there, but I'm not going to subdivide and sell the house. I'm just building another house on my lot. Right. But it's subdividable, um, and so that's often fine. You're going to be doing the septic and everything out there. I would urge everybody to do them code compliant, just because. If you start that way, it's not that much of a pain to deal with them later. And subdividable as well, because it can get really difficult at you know settling in a state if someone has three or four extra places for their kids, and then the, the, you know the parents are gone, and and if then you can't meet the rules with all the different outbuildings and different not. houses, yeah. it, it can get pretty messy so if if they if the subdivision or the potential for a clean subdivision is kind of thought about ahead of time it makes yeah. it a lot easier later on yeah that's where we see a, you know a teeny amount of, of bringing capacity to the table there are a lot of in Rochester there are many double lots out there mm -hmm. that, 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 well, thinking, that you know, are buildable if, if uh, I'm seeing with some of the young kids today where it's they would love nothing more than to stay in Vermont and to stay mm -hmm. local, they can get the job, but they just cannot live anywhere. And it's, right. you know, they want to have their own place where it's like, well, where? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I talk when I'm talking to communities. Nationally, what we have is we have a baby boomlet, you know, we have the baby boomers, and then there's another little secondary hump. So we have about 35 million people that are settling down now. They're tired of, you know, whatever, and they, they want to stop someplace put their kids in school, and they're gonna choose here or Duluth or somewhere. And I say Duluth and people laugh. Trust me, Duluth is on the list um, as one of the top places to go. The, uh, and, and we need those people. And if they decide somewhere else, that's where they're staying, and then we're gonna lose out. You know, Everybody getting older 
is not a long-term plan, right? Well, right now it just seems horrible in, in the sense that kids are going to school, they can go to university here in Vermont, right? But realistically, they're going to have to venture now away, mm -hmm. and it'll just compound the issues that were, you know, really just simply from housing. So these, the ADUs that you're talking about, um, do they have um, funding or rebates or is there any uh, incentives for people to seek out these um, ADUs? There, so, for the, rentals. For Vermont stuff. Housing Improvement um, the VHIP. Program, VHIP, yeah. uh, I think is one of the main ones that's out there right now. And that's up to $50,000 per unit for repairs. You need to bring vacant rental units up to Vermont Rental Housing Health Code -like guidelines. New units to existing building or create ADUs. Um, so if you search up Vermont Housing Improvement Program, they do have an FAQ, and the rent requirements are that they are at or below fair market rent. Oh, so not even 80%, but no. at or below. I looked online today, and they are not taking applications at this time. Not at the moment, but they will open it back up again. They will. Believe. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's just, just quite a round of funding. Yes. Yes. Kevin. Yeah, because yeah, they yeah. limit the amount of m the grant money that goes sure, in there. The you know, and I think they put yeah. $5 million in there. That sounds like a big number until you go, that's 100 units. Yeah. yeah. Woo! So you know. yeah. the VHA program for um, Windsor County, including Rochester, is administered by Windham and Windsor Housing Trust, who has a VHA person. Uh, the Rochester Housing Committee put together a brochure on resources, if you've seen that, and we have his name in that as well, so he would be, he, he would be someone to contact. Hancock and Granville, since they're in different counties, technically are administered by um, a different one. Yeah, works in Western Vermont. Vermont. Yeah. Neighbor, neighbor, works, so. neighbor works in Western Vermont. Um, the person from Wyndham Windsor did say that if he gets calls from Hancock or Granville, he can like triage you. Yeah. He's not. <laughs> he's not going to like ignore, or refuse to pick up the phone from anyone, from the, but from the county of Windsor. So, yeah. So when you're. Um, with the this program that you're just talking about and you're saying that you need to rent at fair market um have fair market rent does that just mean like literally in the news you, you were advertising and that's what the rent is or do you ha have to specifically take people that are involved in a program through it just said fair market rent so, so it's, it's whatever it hud dictates is fair market rent for your county um is what you would have to rent at or below Okay, so it's not specifically getting anybody yeah. from Section 8 or any... Right, now there may be other programs assistance. that have funding, and the programs have changed sort of over the last few years as the legislature has changed, changed their programming. Um, and the different, um, like Vermont State Housing Authority had some programs. There's definitely just some research about yeah. what's out there. Okay. Um, there are some or have been some programs that had those preferences. Okay. And you would work with different... Um, coordinated entry systems to see if somebody was on the coordinated entry list. That's a whole homeless management system that exists mm -hmm. in the state. Um, you would, and it prioritizes who is recommended for um, different units based on their priority, on the priority on the list where they fall um, based on their situation. But not all of the programs uh, connect to that. Yeah. Sometimes there are MOUs that require that. Um, we have those with different uh, housing authorities and things sometimes, but okay. a lot of different programs with a lot of different rules. Yeah, yeah okay. Yes. Well, that's, that's good to know that there are so many options out there. Yeah. And if they're like a Montpelier's uh, ADU program, that Montpelier kicked in $30,000 per ADU to people who did it. Uh, Woodstock is doing $10,000. Um, so there are other places, and, and I encourage communities to, to look at the community mm -hmm. uh, being part of that because you go, well, why should we spend money to do whatever? And you go, because then those people work in town and they do things in town and they go buy food at the grocery store and maybe they're a plow driver. And, you know, I'll, it's just the business model. It takes money to make money. All sorts of reasons why you might want to do that and why it's, you know, you think $10,000 or something, that's a big thing. A big bit of money. So, if if you do an ADU <coughs> and it's for a family member and you choose not to rent it, mm -hmm. then does can you still get the subsidy, or must you rent it? I think it has to be yeah. a part of the rental market. VHIP is just for rent, yeah. So you could you could rent to your adult child. Right, you could um, rent to a family. I know I, it said you could rent to a family member, but you have to collect rent. 
that could be. I don't know. I haven't seen that piece Those of it. Those kids are going to yeah. pay. Yeah. <laughs> I know we have programs where we can't pay landlords who are family members, but those. Yeah, this I'm not sure what this program yeah. has yet. And I think it's rent stabilized for five years is the latest yes. version yeah. of VIP. Okay. Um, is there a, um, what's, what, is there a single factor driving this or is this being driven by just a housing shortage in general for multiple um, groups of people in that mix? versus a housing, housing, housing shortage, for, you mentioned homelessness, mm -hmm. you know, a housing shortage to solve that problem, because some of the stuff you're talking about isn't going to solve the homeless issue, by no means. I mean, Geo's homes are not being sold to someone who's homeless. But is there's there, a trickle-down effect. But is so there a single thing that's people, driving that, or is it multiple things? I, I think the issue of homelessness right now is really driving, is the impetus behind this. 18% okay. of our population was homeless last year. Um, and that's a whole brand. I mean, we have doctors that are calling in that don't have a place to live, yeah. that are living in hotels. Um, we yeah. have, you know, we had heard that the Burger King down in New Hampshire, their, their employees are living in their parking lot in a car. Um, there are people that are employed that are living in their vehicles, they are living in the hotel system, um, and they are homeless. They are literally homeless. Yeah. And because yeah. there is nowhere to go, and the, the result is we have 18% of our population the, that is unhoused. Right. And there is a, the trickle down, like this. Mm -hmm. The house I hopefully will sell in the mm -hmm. next week is actually it's a it's a young couple. He's from Chelsea, she's from Sharon. They got a young family, so they're Vermonters. Yeah. Um, so they own another house in Chelsea that they need they need to that they're selling. Yeah. So that's going to be a s smaller, mm -hmm. more le less expensive right. house. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. Okay. And so it's cause there's a, there's your trickle down yeah. that somebody else that is renting, now somebody else buy. got into the market. Yeah. These guys upscaled. So that really is what's written, what's causing the government to put all of this money into the housing market. We are in big trouble. Makes sense. I have a question yeah. for Kevin. Yeah. And that is um, the effect of Airbnb, because I think some of those units mm. take <laughs> what could be livable spaces um, off the market. And, and can towns, I know they can write ordinances that right. can prevent Airbnbs, but do you think it's a huge problem in our region or not so much? I think it varies by town. Um, so the towns that people would want to go in and potentially, you know, if you're in Stowe or whatever, um, it's a huge problem. If you're in Woodstock, if you're in Barnard or Bridgewater or maybe surrounding there, my town Pomford a little bit, maybe so. But I think it's really for the destination towns where people want to go there. I think it'll, it'll spread out a little bit more. Rock Jester, why not? Um, but yes, so you can regulate short-term rentals, towns can regulate short-term rentals. Even if you don't have zoning, you can pass your own standalone short-term rental ordinance um, around how that actually, how many, how long they do, as an owner, does the owner have to live on site, a, a variety of things out there. Um, that, you know, but I don't think short-term rentals are driving the housing crisis in Granville. Um, I, it, I think you might be surprised, Kevin. I'm going to push back a little bit on you. Okay. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I mean, I think that the fact of the matter is, uh, as the Housing Committee member, we have identified that the, the there is something like 53 Airbnbs. Um, and in Rochester, yeah. In Rochester, yeah. And um, uh, as a business owner, we can't find help. There is a help wanted sign in almost every business in town. Mm -hmm. Those two things we've identified that there is a there's a major problem that there is no place for the worker bees to live. And it, it's been a, a, an issue for three years. Um, our school teachers can't find a our exactly. can't find yeah. a and I, I have two, to I have two apartments. Yeah. It's, that's, so that's the push I was gonna so to right to so we had um, we had an in-law apartment, an ADU, I guess, to, <laughs> in the modern part prevalence that my in-laws actually lived in for 16 years. And then uh, they left and we rented it out. And there was a, a, a group of law school students who weren't around for the summer. And my wife approached them and said, can we put this on Airbnb? Because they still have to pay rent even though they're not there because they were going to come back and live the next season. 
and it's all furnished because it all stuffs. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll just split the money half and half. You guys do the work. We made double the money that we would have gotten rent. Exactly. Double. I mean, okay. so there's a lot of people doing it. And, yeah. and if it, like you said, Dean, if it's just taking 50 units out, that's an, even though it's not in, maybe in Woodstock and in Hanover and Stowe, it's taking hundreds of units out. Yeah. But 50 units in Rochester, it's yeah. a big it's deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so I could see it a lot in, in certain towns. I think what it's also driving is it's, is it's driving up the price because a house that you live in is a different value than a house that you can rent out and, and you know, turn over that money in. Um, that's a taxation issue that I think the legislature could solve like that um, if they wanted to. The, there are other issues out there. Back to your question, my take on it is we treat houses like money. So let's not be surprised that people treat houses like money. Um, and the money does not care if any of you have a place to live. And it never did. It just worked for a while. And I use it with homeless. Um, all of us are homeless or pre-homeless. Those are the two categories we exist in. And we should all think about it that way. Um, what happened for a long time is a bunch of us could afford houses. And so we thought it worked because it worked for us. There were always people it didn't work for. Now some of us are falling into that category, and we go, oh, it's the system's broken. You go, no, you're well, just welcome to the bus, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, there are always people on that side, and so it's this exact same system. It's the exact same drivers. And to me, again, through tax policies and other things, if we decide we want houses for people to live in or we want houses to make money on, we could treat those as different things. You want to do this? Fine. But... We're going to put boxes around that, um, but this is really what we want houses for, and that's that's a different. That's not a zoning thing, and a it's, that's a different kind of construct out there. When the pandemic blew up on us, because yeah. people came in and they started buying up houses, mm -hmm. and they came in and they started renting, and they pay a year's worth of rent. So if you have somebody that's working a service sector job and might struggle to pay you month to month, and you have somebody from out of state that needs a place to go, and they're going to give you twelve months up front. You're taking the you person go, out of state. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of where it started blowing up and where it became a, a, a very public issue mm -hmm. for us. And then we have seen people that um, rented from places for 20 years. Great mm -hmm. histories. Right. But the landlords want to get out of the market, so they're selling the homes. Mm -hmm. um, we have people that sold their homes because it was a great buyer's market. It wasn't great when you sold your home that you've lived in for the last three decades and now have nowhere to go. And there's nothing, nothing there. Um, so really we are seeing the impact across the board. And, and, I don't know, my way of thinking that the Airbnb boom, if you will, mm -hmm. is kind of a double-edged sword for a community of, like Rochester, I think. Uh, yes, we need housing, but if you took those 50 some odd units and took all the people who rent, and they didn't go to Maple Soul, they didn't go to the Rochester Cafe, they didn't go here. To, what impact does that have on your community, right. too? Right. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's not a, just a right. black or white. Yeah. Right. It's a balance. Like, so, like, like peanut butter, in a certain amount, it is toxic. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's worth the ride. Yeah. There's an article that we'd read recently, and I apologize because I can't remember what it was, but it talked about the impact of, there's, there's a few very big corporations that are out there buying up real estate right now, and that's, raising the market it's raising the cost of houses a first-time home buyer you can't get a house the way you used to you're talking four hundred thousand dollars minimum mm -hmm. um, when we look at rents when we're trying to find rents for people we're finding one bedrooms for fifteen sixteen hundred dollars a month two bedrooms over two thousand dollars i don't know about your budget but two thousand dollars would put a big dent in mine um, and i have a decent job so somebody who's making 13 14 15 bucks an hour that's not possible The 53 doesn't include just the second homes, also of folks that aren't Airbnb no. it, but just no. happen to have a second home in Rochester right. and come maybe right. three which weeks is, out of the year. Which is another problem. That's another yeah. 50, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, another, it's almost yeah. the worst problem because they, 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 they're not bringing the in. The space is totally under 
Yeah, yeah they're coming in. They're coming in two weeks a year. Right, and nobody. They aren't bringing the kids to the school. To right. right. Yeah. 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 I right. do want to mention if anybody is a landlord for folks that um, do receive assistance, there is the Vermont um, Landlord Relief Program. Mm -hmm. So folks are struggling. There are some supports out there as well. Yeah. Yeah. The state did a, a, a study in 2018, which was actually. Um, which estimated because evictions are a problem, and but a lot of evictions are just, you know, one speed bump in somebody's mm -hmm. life. That's really the problem. And the state estimated that for eight hundred thousand dollars a year, they could prevent half the evictions mm -hmm. in, the, in the state. Mm -hmm. And you go, ice cream truck, give that money. <laughs> just, just here's here's the money. You pass that speed bump because you think of all that the millions and millions of dollars that causes problems and people go i gotta take my kid out of school i'm losing my job the factory now i gotta help on it sign on the window just just the repercussions go on you it's, it's, it's change so we are coming up on the end of our time we probably have time for one more, one more question if there's any final question just so you know, in your town, we are Sarah Raid from our office is working with Sandy and other folks in the Planning Commission, and so your zoning is um, nearing the final stage. Of, like, can I say nearing the final stages? Yeah. Uh, nearing the final stages of getting rewritten all over um, to incorporate the new stuff the legislature passed plus some extras, and so zoning as a boogeyman is no longer really going to be a thing. Um, in Rochester and, and isn't a thing in most places. That's not the issue. It's still paperwork and a pain, but the, the permit hurdles are, are pretty much going away, I would say. Nice. Yeah. D and Geo, anything else, anything final you want to share? I wanted also to clarify the do-it-yourself versus needing a licensed plumber and electrician and when those would kick in. So. Oh, it is actually. Yeah, you own a single family house, you can wire, you can plumb it. You can do anything you want. It's your house. But having said that, I make sure I do everything to code because that building inspector, when I go to sell the house, is going to come open that panel. Mm -hmm. And if it looks like shit, someone that, that's going to affect me. So it's, you know, I'm right at code. Um, it's not that single family homes aren't, so they, there is a residential building code in Vermont. It's just not enforced for single family homes. I mean, it exists, IRC, yeah. and the state statute references it, but it just isn't enforced for owner-occupied single-family homes. And I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure if, it's, I, I, if I own the place, I can have two units, and I can still wire and plumb it myself. But yeah. if I go beyond two, then I have to have a licensed person. Yeah, that's what we, we did three units, and we had to have the licensed plumber, electrician, yeah. and we had to meet fire code, so all the the units are fire separated. I, I get around that because my brother-in-law is a licensed electrician in Vermont, and he just puts it on his, I, I can wire under somebody else's license. That's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, the, the, anybody you hire, is a, is you hire an electrical contractor, probably, and they have seven people working for them, probably three of them don't have any, because they're, they're, they're wiring under somebody else's license. But, but that person's liable if anything goes wrong. And all bets are off when you're on a commercial building. Mm -hmm. You have to have everybody certified and pull permits to do anything, as I own two of them. It, it, it basically layers the, the issues. I basically, when I did it, I, I, I called everybody that I knew and said, what do I have to do? Tell me, tell me the path. And... Um, and I did it. It was not cheap, but basically, you know, the fire marshal, the electrical inspector, the plumbing inspector, everybody basically said, yeah, well, you have to do this, this, and this. And so it was done. It's just like, it's, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of work. Uh, but if you don't do that, you're, you can get hit on the other side of not complying. Yeah, they're very easy to deal with. Landlord wheeler columns down right one. Yeah. So as we wrap up tonight's conversation, this is actually a good time to plug like the next thing that the Rochester Area Housing Committee has been working on. So the committee's really like thought out a, a pipeline of how we can support the Rochester community in creating more housing. So um, 
we already have another event date set in December, and maybe someone can, if anyone remembers the date, because I'm terrible at remembering dates. In December, we'll be having a follow-up event for folks who are interested in digging even deeper into this. This was really set up as a panel, but the December event will be more of a networking event, so opportunity to like, meet one-on-one -on -one with people who can provide advice and opinions and give you their contact information like and talk to you specifically about your situation. It's December 7th at 6.30. Thank you so much. I don't remember your dates. At the school cafeteria. Yes. So we're still in the process of organizing that, but we can promise that we'll be bringing folks who can like talk directly with you about your situation. So that's sort of the next level of detailed follow-up around this. Anything else, Deb, that you want to say about from the committee perspective? No, just that um, this uh, video will be put on the uh, Rochester Town website under ORCA, because there were people that had called that couldn't attend that were wondering if they could access mm -hmm. it. So it will be Great. there. And um, and I know as part of the Housing Committee, I am going to figure out how to talk to someone about this um, neighborhood designation, because mm -hmm. I think that's really important for the community. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, huge thank you to our panelists. This was really great having you. Um, and I'll like come back to you. Never do Rotten fruit. So I think that's pretty much it. I think um, whatever we can do to be creative and try to resolve this issue. Thank you. We're not going to do it alone. We need to do it together. Yeah, and there's information up here if you're interested um, on the state of housing in Vermont.